Welcome to Book Rising, a podcast by the Radical Books Collective. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our podcast, The Book Rising. I'm so excited to welcome Jennifer McCombie to the studio today. And she will be an incredible addition to our ongoing trailblazing African feminist compilation. Jennifer Makumbi is a Ugandan writer and has published two critically acclaimed novels, Chintu in 2014 and A Girl is a Body of Water in 2020. She is also the author of a collection of stories titled Manchester Happened and the recipient of prestigious fellowships and awards such as the Kwani Manuscript Prize, the Wyndham Campbell Prize, and only recently, the Jalak Prize. Congratulations, Jennifer, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Bhakti. Uh, I'm so glad to be with you today. Thanks so much. So I have, a, I have a, a first question that I think you've been asked before, but I'm asking with adoration and inspiration. Uh, and as a fan of all your work. So Chintu is almost 500 pages long and A Girl is a Body of Water is almost 600 pages long. So you have a lot to say. Why do you write such long novels? Oh my God, the way you say it, they sound even <laughs> long to me. <laughs> They're wonderful. No, honestly, there's something about American publishing that makes the novels longer because I think they're both 400 pages in British publishing. I think we make the, the, the pages bigger and over there the pages are smaller, so they look longer. But honestly, Bhakti, I don't plan to write long novels. They surprise me too at the end of it. Um, and, you know, I do not even know why I write long novels, you know, but uh, for me, um, a story is as long as it should be. So I, when I'm writing, I don't pay much attention to the word count. But at the end of it, I look at it and I'm like, oh, oh, knowing what publish is going to say, you know. But at the same time, I know that my novels are very busy and they're hardworking and they do a lot, you know, uh, because I read back and I see I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing that. So they tend to be busier than other novels that I read. So that explains why uh, they are long, but also because they take a long time to write. And I find myself developing issues over a long time and thinking about them and revisiting them and taking them in all sorts of directions that they can go. And I, I suspect that the longevity that I've had, those two books, uh, the first one, uh, the, A Girl is a Body of Water and Chinto, probably contributed to their length. And, and, and again, if I handle an issue, I want to take it mm -hmm. as far I can, as I can see. I, I mean, uh, and I think that probably is a result of doing a PhD. <laughs> God, you don't want to be a writer and do a PhD because you don't want to look at your story from that perspective. But sometimes I can't help it. And uh, I keep asking myself, what else? can I say about this issue? What haven't I said about this issue? Often I ask, what have other people said about this issue? So I don't have to do it again and just uh, focus on uh, what hasn't been done. And in a way I find my, the book uh, growing bigger and bigger, but uh, I'm waiting for the next uh, three, novels um, to see. The one I'm working on right now is, is a very short, eight, you know, 80,000 you know, 80, words, okay. which is, that is around 200. 200 
something, something like pages yeah mm -hmm. so um but that one is um aimed at both adults and young readers so that explains it i'm i'm holding back a lot yeah. i'm not playing a around with language uh, at all um, so i don't have to contextualize I have not included Luganda words except where I can help it. And uh, I am not thinking about the critical aspects of what I'm writing or what um, theoretical paradigms would inform what I'm writing about. So that has made it probably shorter. And I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not not to not to take you off track but uh i have an 11 year old son who incessantly reads you know these epic young adult novels i mean even someone like rowling is at some point jk rowling was writing 900 page novels. i know, I know. <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm thinking i'm okay here because <laughs> yeah young readers were reading them Yes, absolutely. And I love the term busy uh, because there is so much happening in your novels. Uh, there is also so much depth um, and there is such a kind of glut for storytelling. You have such an intense talent for storytelling. And, you know, I'm glad they are as long as they are because uh, it's a whole world that unfolds in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, literary critics or like uh, uh, literature scholars like me have observed and many people have said this uh, is that a lot of African women writers have produced uh, long historical novels in the past decade. We have Maza mm -hmm. Mengiste's magnum opus, you know, The Shadow King, uh, yes, yes. Yvonne of War, you know, she is, uh, she is, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's you know, dense, long, intense, lots of pages, wonderful work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Namwali Serpel has the big Zambian epic. Uh, so, you know, what do you think is going on? Is there some kind of uh, reckoning with the past or uh, an embrace of the form that's taking place? Well, I can only guess what other, um, what uh, Maaza, Ma Yvonne, and Namwali are doing and 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 to a certain extent Yvonne Vera was also reckoning with the past but hers were very tiny books she's the uh the different one but um but for me having grown up on African literature and I, for goodness sakes I studied African literature intensively when I was in Uganda and I was aware that between the 19 50s and 60s, perhaps early 70s. There were hardly any women writers that were being published. The few that were, we hardly read them. And the history that was being written then was masculine. Okay. On top of that, oral histories, at least in Buganda, tended to be incredibly masculinist. And they were all about um, masculine action and how they built the kingdoms and how they shaped the, the, the culture, uh, the, the economy and all of that. And so feminine action was often missing and that which existed was always distorted. So it only managed to get into visibility because it was horrendous, wow. you know, uh, often. Um, and so, of course, we women were reading those novels and we were seeing the gaps and the distortion and how we were absent in history. So it's not surprising that the minute we've picked up the pen to write, we are going back into history to fill in those gaps. Absolutely. You know, but also remember history is gendered. The way mm -hmm. it's presented, it, it's gendered, of course, among other things like class or, or sexuality, but the way we saw history is not necessarily the way um, men who are writing novels at the time saw it. So it's very, very important for us for at least for me to go back and correct so there's a corrective uh, agenda there 
and sometimes, you know, for a long time, we were told all oh, men are the, uh, um, are the custodians of African culture. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but you're miswriting it. You're misrepresenting it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's not surprising that we are going back there to say, look, before we launch into the present and the future, we need to validate ourselves mm -hmm. in the past. We need to correct some of the things that have been miswritten, and then we come. We can come to the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I'm. I'm sure. Uh, I'm. I'm certain the other novelists will share this uh, uh, sentiment, especially the paradox of being custodians of culture, but at the same time uh, not being able to write in or engage that culture. So I think that is so being interesting. Being written in that culture as yeah, well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> being representative or constitutive of that culture. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree. Uh, and if you look at all those novels, The Old Drift by Namuali Sapel, mm -hmm. um, 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 if you look at Ma uh, Maazim Mengistis, the, um, the Shadow King, and uh, to a certain extent, both um, Yv Yvonne Awali's book mm -hmm. and Yvonne Vera's... Um, Stone Virgins? No, no, it's the other one with a tight name, a character title. Uh, butterfly. Um, anyway. The, 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 um, the woman who was the... Um, the beginning of the uh, Zimbabwean revolution. I see. It, 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 it's all, if you look at those novels, they are excavating. Mm -hmm. They are excavating history. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and you can see that they are looking for these women who are part of struggles and have been absent and they are, bringing them into a visibility. It's not just mine. Eh? It's, it's every woman's historical novel you look at, they are saying, hang on a minute, we did take part in shaping our cultures, in shaping our societies, and we were part of the political struggles as well. Ne Nehanda. Um, Nehanda, that's yeah. it, that's okay. it. So you, you and, and I think Nehanda was the first novel that I read where a woman writer was like, hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. She's been miswritten. She's been misunderstood. They've taken her femininity out of her and she's just a political figure rather than a woman as well. Mm -hmm. And she is rewriting her. And I was like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. So when I came across uh, in Chintu, when I came across um, female figures in history that have been miswritten or totally buried, I, I, I exhumed them. I was like, hang on a minute. And it was surprising that later, some of the women that I'd written about started to pop up in now in history, you know, having done much more than I had mm -hmm. written. And I was like, hang on a minute. Where have you been? Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, you're, you're talking a little bit about these inspirations and um, <clears throat> some of the things that make you do the kind of work that you do. So I just wanted to ask you a bit about the origins of your um, writing journey. You know, it seems like you produce two epic novels and the story collection very quickly. Uh, it's less than a decade, one would say. So, mm -hmm. but these works are something you've been trying to publish for a while, right? And it's the timing that clicked suddenly. Could you tell us a bit more? Yeah, so in the past 20 years, I've written three books. So um, if you look at 23 books, that would mean probably each book took me six years to write. But to be quite frank with you, my first novel is A Girl is a Body of Water. Mm -hmm. I created those characters back in, in 1998, Chirabo and her grandparents and Gensota and her father and her mother. They were done in, in 1998. But then 
I didn't pay much attention to the book. And then in 2021, I started working on the book seriously, finished it in 2003, and it was rejected. Reworked it in, in up to 2005, it was rejected. Reworked it in 2008, and it was rejected. So I put it away. And in 2003, I had started Jinto. Mm -hmm. So I would put one away and work on the other, you know, and put one away and work on the other. And in a way, perhaps they started to get in dialogue with each other as, as, I, as I did that. And so the short stories, I started them in 2008. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was the time that clicked. And I think I'm one of those people who write pretty slowly, but that, uh, you know, the fact that the, what I explained in the first question about the length of the book mm -hmm. perhaps makes sense why um, um, the, I write slowly. But um, these are books I've been trying to publish for a very long time, you know. Mm -hmm. But, but is, isn't it a bit odd that the same book is rejected and then and then suddenly it finds publication and then the next one and the next one like what is it that shifts um I, you know what i don't know i am just going to give you what i think mm -hmm. okay uh, uh i felt that perhaps readers in the west were not ready for my kind of writing specifically my perspective that is writing that is not centering their readerships, but uh, centering uh, readerships outside the 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 the, the, the West. Mm -hmm. Or, and I believe this to be true, publishers could have been a little too cautious, you know, because of market reactions, you know, um, or. Publishers might be a little patronizing mm -hmm. to their readers, especially Western readers. They may not believe that Western readers could read books that are not addressed to them and understand them, which is, of course, dumb. Um, but it's also possible that the market has changed. I, I, I have no idea. But if somehow, somewhere, they realize that the reader is not just this middle-class white woman. Right. They are now realizing that the whole world reads, okay? And the whole world exists in the West. Right. And it reads in the West, because this is, and this is the problem. Most of our publishers focus mainly on Western readerships, okay? They might have the Commonwealth uh, rights, but they're not going to sell my books in Singapore. Mm -hmm. They may not focus so much selling my books in India. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And yet when they publish Dan Brown, they're going to market him all around the world. Yeah. You know? So I think all of that came into play. But now as, as um, they realize the, the readership power of non-whites, Okay, but also realizing that white people are interested in other ways of being. They, uh, I think things are clicking now. And now with Black Lives Matter happening, I think it's going to get better. Because for me, it happened around 2017 when the market opened up. But even then, it was very tiny, very slow. 2018, it did a little bit more. 2019, a little bit more. 2020, much more. But I hope 
now that it's going to open up a mm -hmm. lot more. Um, and, and I think now that we are working with the publishers, so for example, my publisher is aware that when my books come out, I want them to be sent to Uganda and to East Africa mm -hmm. quickly, and that I want to launch my book there. But I think it's, I'm now starting to think wider than that. And I'm trying to think that I should market myself in the Caribbean as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and, and I should market myself to as well to African America, South African America, you know, but I, I, those I am going to claim as my market. My publisher can work on the others. I am think that's the way I'm thinking now. That if I, I if I centered Uganda, Africa, and they've responded, you know, I can therefore reach out to wider African world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add India to the mix. All it needs is to get on one exam list for the masters uh, students in India, <sighs> and then people read read like mad. You know, the amount of graduate students applying right now to programs uh, at the university where I am and they're from India and they often want to write theses on African writers you know so I, 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 I do believe you one time I was lucky to be taken to Jaipur oh, okay <laughs> oh my day I mean I saw this festival and I say to myself there's still a market because mm -hmm. the number of people at this festival, because it was free, okay, it was free of charge. Back to, we had a whole palace to authors. Now, <laughs> let me tell you, the authors in the palace were as numerous as everybody you find on any day at Edin Edinburgh Festival. Mm -hmm. Those were just the authors, okay? Wow. Mm -hmm. And if you were going out to have an event, you had somebody in front of you with a whistle and somebody behind you with a whistle because there was no space to pass. This is, <laughs> and this were all young people. Right. And so they would blow the whistle and say, author coming through us. I loved it. <laughs> shameless author coming through it's like sirens oh i love it you know and they would set up a tent i mean at one point it was us three authors from africa no known around india i was with no violet bulawayo mm -hmm. and um so he's one yeah um, and we were somebody put up a tent and said this is us and we kept on saying oh my god it's going to be empty it was full. Wow. <laughs> we thought, okay, if these people have given us their time without knowing us, let's entertain them. Because across the, the, the path was Ben Okri's, mm -hmm. and Ben Okri is big in India. So we knew everybody was going to go there. So we were like, let's tell Ben's people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that is how big India is. And yeah. one last Sorry, I, I'd like to share with you about mm -hmm. uh, Jaipo. So we were, the three of us were seated uh, signing books when three little girls came, which one of them with our, oh. one of our book? And they said, can you sign all three books, the three of you, because we haven't decided who is taking which book. We've bought all three. <laughs> we are going to read all three because we don't have the money. I was like, mm. This is there. <laughs> this is where I want to be. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reading culture in India is is amazing, and you know we have a lot of uh, people to populate <laughs> events. <laughs> you know, so, oh my days, oh my yeah, days. It is yeah. the best festival. That's um, fun. That's super fun. Um, a very quick question. I was I asked this to uh, some other authors as well. Um, mm -hmm. When we're talking about the timing of publishing and uh, Western audiences being ready for non-white writers and voices, um, 
did it feel that the does it seem that the UK is different uh, from the US in this case, because it does seem that the UK just because of its colonial relations or proximity tends to publish uh, you know, certain African writers that actually don't come as much to the US, like mm. Abdul Raza Gurna or Leila Abu Leila, who are very well known in the UK, but not as much in the US. And in the US, we have a different non white category, which is we have a lot of uh, African American writers that populate the diversity category at some level, right? So, do you feel that it's different? I mean, even in the UK, you felt there was pushback to your work? Um, and the, the was, it is very hard to tell that because uh, you found, I came across many readers in the UK who were like, who said we wouldn't be able to read these books? You know, that is patronizing to us, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but sometimes you would say, oh, you know, if you're not going to write in the language that I understand, why should I read you? And that sort of thing, but America, America is a very closed mm -hmm. society. You know, everybody that comes to America conforms and becomes American. <laughs> In Britain, we come and we say, no, 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 we are not. You know, we're going to be who we are. You know, mm -hmm. and that makes the readers here interested in who we are. So books like uh, Brick Lane, when they came out, were interesting to the British because they thought, oh, they are British Asians. They're just like us. Mm -hmm. And then they find out, no, actually, there's an Asian Britain, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. But uh, uh, America is willing to pay attention to African-Americans, but for goodness sakes, what? African, African? Oh, for crying <laughs> out. What is that? And, yeah. and, and, and I remember I was shortlisted for an award and they asked me, can you tell us how your book has been speaking to the major issues that have been going on? And I knew they were looking for uh, Black Lives Matter and it's, and it was now there is another world outside America, you know. <laughs> Indeed, there is. But that does not mean that the readers themselves, because there's something called a system, mm -hmm. and then there are individuals. Because I've found Americans who have discovered my books, they're like, surprised. What? How come we didn't know about you? Where have your books been? And I'm like, I've been around. But the system that promotes particular authors, the system that uh, pushes an author into big readerships, you know, uh, we might will not put, pick, pick on a book that is not talking about Americans. So if you look at, for example, Chimamanda's writing, the book that uh, launched her was Americana. Mm -hmm. But yet her um, Half a Yellow Sun is an incredible, incredible book. Absolutely. And the Americans hadn't picked up on it until she talked about them. Just, oh, 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 okay. So there's that. Or oh, if you live in America, that's the other thing, you know, mm -hmm. then they can pay attention to you. But if you're not going to write about Americans, you're not you're not living in the US for goodness sakes there's enough read writing here mm. right yeah they need to see themselves mirrored this is unfortunately very true in film and in uh, and in uh, books um i'm i'm remembering uh, some months ago when you came for a radical books collective book club and mm -hmm. we had all been discussing girl is a body of water and everybody um you know everybody was thinking a lot about actually the three main characters in the book, the three generations. Yeah, um, yeah. And it seemed like the middle generation, the mother, the, uh, the missing mother, 
uh, was not a significant portion of the book. Her perspective wasn't in there. And uh, you then told us, oh, that's because it got cut. And you seemed not particularly phased by it. We were all very shocked. Is this part and parcel of publishing about a world that may be unfamiliar to Western editors? Yes, uh, absolutely. So actually that book was cut at agent level. Wow. So I sent the book to my agent in London. He read it and he wrote back and said, Jennifer, this is too big. Mm -hmm. They publishers getting get and got, um, worried about big books that are too big. So, but you have to realize that the process of publishing is a tug of war between author and publisher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most publishers are a business, you know, business enterprise. They are looking for profit in order to survive in the market. But the author often does not care so much about making money as to getting their message out there. So the two sometimes don't align, you know, and the publisher has this formula of how books make money. And often they try to get old books and fit into that formula. Well, as authors, we hate being placed in boxes. We like to think of ourselves as unique, you know. Sure. So it all depends on your success as an author. Mm -hmm. J.K. Rowling will get away with murder. You know, I was at an event where Salman Rushdie imitated the writing style because he said the 900 pages is just too much. And he says, I can think of like hundreds of pages that could be cut because it repeats. It was very, very funny and somewhat somewhat mean, but very funny. And it's true. Like nobody stops her, you know. And it's the same with Dan Brown. Right. No, absolutely. All those people who sell millions of copies. Their books arrive to the publisher with a siren. Oh my God, oh my God, the book is coming. You know, the manuscript <laughs> is coming, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so you can imagine, it, it's not that the authors are pushy or they are hissy or they're being um, precautious or no, precious about their books. It's just that there's the way power is perceived in monetary terms and in the influence because you know if you know that your publishing industry your, your your publishing house has been made by this author the way you treat them is different so it wasn't that um jk rowling apparently was fun or anything it's just that the editors feared mm -hmm. to push of that you know, they just feared. So if she said, no, that stays, it stayed. But me, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the, the, the editors are like, nah, right. that doesn't work, Jennifer. To be fair, um, I tend to ed edit my work before I send it to uh, the, the, the publisher. So the publishers are aware that the book has been edited, but also because now, they are aware that it's not just the story that is going on, but it's also my, um, uh, the way I'm engaging the, uh, the language as a colonial entity is a thing. So mm -hmm. they, um, they don't push back too much. They just look for clarification, you know? Right. Um, so, um, I was not phased because that book was rejected from 2003. <laughs> you know, right. it's 17 years. Yeah. I was ready to cut the, that character out and, 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 and incorporate small elements of her. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. When I told my American publisher, she was like, oh my God, um, I would like to have a look at that. 
And perhaps uh, uh, after a decade, when we do the 10 years edition, we'll, we'll include it. And I'm looking forward to that. Wow, okay, that's interesting. I mean, I, you know, one can, literary critics can argue for and against anything and one can say it's very strong without and 10 years later, I'm happy to read and find it stronger with. So that's exciting actually. Yeah, that's- I think um, they would have paid more attention to her as you said, mm-hmm. you know, that she she's absent in the, in a, she, yeah, she's invisible. Yeah. I think when you look at what she was, uh, what she went through, why she is the way she is, then the, the, there's a discussion to have around her. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, at the same uh, at this same time when you came, when you uh, did some events here uh, at my university, you spoke mm-hmm. about uh, you know being a Ugandan writer being published in the UK, and that over the years you had observed um, something about audiences and readerships, and you also mentioned it in our conversation today the decentering of what you think of as readers, uh, readerships. And you said uh, something important about the ways in which histories of empire have made it such that African authors tend to write to the center, but that you uh, are thinking of the ways in which uh, this cannot be the case anymore, Can that this must change. Um, so uh, th- this goes back to the novel being a unique form in Africa, because in in the form that it is now, and I always uh, acknowledge that there have been found manuscripts that would constitute of novels in Africa, especially in Ethiopia. But the novel as it is now, um, traveled from Europe Mm -hmm. with the colonizers, Okay, now drama and poetry, those existed in Africa, you know, as forms. And um, there were theaters and there were performers of of plays and there were performers of poetry. So colonization did not have a major influence on those forms. But when it came to the novel, because of its nature and the processes of production and the language that we languages that we write in which are colonial languages it meant that the west had such strong power and influence over the novel first of all they looked at the the african novel as emergent Mm -hmm. and therefore it was it was treated as a child, you know, who has no alternative but to grow. So you still hear terms, patronizing terms like, oh, the African novel has made leaps and bounds. And you're like, where is it going? And how do you know? Who are you to tell us <laughs> that it's grown or it hasn't grown? So uh, because of the production processes. Africans were just producing the novel, the writing, the way we produced cotton and coffee. I've never thought of it. Wow. That. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. still thinking, oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so we handed over this raw material to the British. Mm-hmm. And they edited, they processed it, you know, they edited it. And then the um, and that editing process is like threefold mm-hmm. and then they published it and then they reviewed it and they marketed it mm-hmm. and they studied it so all those processes oh my god yeah it's like cotton and coffee isn't it <laughs> That, that is some serious shade to the Heinemann uh, writer series right there. Oh, um, by the way, I'm collecting Heinemann writer series. I want to collect all of them. So, mm-hmm. you know, but <laughs> because that's history as well. Yes, but, but it is it is a factory. It's a fact. It, there is a factory element to it. Absolutely. You know. <laughs> so um, because of that, 
that power. Um, the West made sure that we were writing to them. And it didn't help matters because at that in the beginning, writers were writing to the empire about colonization. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and also there were no, in the beginning, there were no, there was no readership in English in Africa. So basically they were writing to the empire and the empire had the market. And so the empire told them, this is how a book should be. This is what a novel should be. Or oh, that's not a good one. That won't be published. Oh, that is, oh God, they're, they're, it's terrible. These are the good ones. And, and therefore you can see the books that made it through you know, which the empire said were the good ones. But if you look at the rest of Heinemann, the books, the, a lot of them fell on the wayside. So um, because of that, a, a kind of trend started that we were writing to the empire, but then it became a habit and it became the way we write. Because mm -hmm. for a long time, we did not, wrench back the power in terms of publishing ourselves, in terms of growing markets, so that the market could say, A, B, C, D, this is what we're looking for. This is what we want. So um, the West has kept this much power. And it's until you're part of the West and you start to read the way the West is writing itself. And the, you look at the way Africa is writing itself and you realize the West is writing to its primary market. Mm -hmm. And you realize Africa is writing to its secondary readership, which is the West. Um, and the West, when you don't, the West demands, oh my God, how dare, if there's no this, there's no that, what, that, what do you mean, we? And you realize that the we excludes your people you know so right. I th this is why i think it should change yeah and you are an example in a way of that change because chintu uh was was brought to the west uh because of the power and magic of african publishing and this is a story we've heard that it's those review circuits you know all the the prize you won in kenya all of those are the ones that really uplifted and amplified Chintu in a way, and then it was sort of everywhere. This is true, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Chintu was completed in 2012. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of 2013, it won the Kwani Manuscript Project Prize. And part of the prize was to publish it. Mm -hmm. So in 2014, it came out around June. And the people who first read it were Kenyans and Ugandans, because that, those are the only two places it was uh, launched. And I swear to you, it was a few bloggers, but mostly word of mouth, that that book started to make its way around Africa. And once it traveled to West Africa, because this is now where we have the biggest market um, um, uh, in Nigeria. And people started to pick up on it. And, mm -hmm. and of course, then it started to, it st people started talking about it on social media, you know, but it was mostly Africans there who were talking about it. The West started especially um, 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 scholars, and English departments in the West, mm -hmm. who were the first people to start writing to me and saying, we've heard of this. How do we get hold of it? And then Kenya started to find ways of sending this book to many African um, uh, uh, American departments, English departments and universities. And the book, they started teaching it, but they were buying the book from Kenya. It, 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 I won the Global Commonwealth Short Story Prize. Now that's huge. That was in 2014. Guess what? No one was interested in Chint. <laughs> it, 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 it was ridiculous. And then it comes out um, and, and, and the publisher who, 
picked up on it was a small publisher beginning and took a chance on it. Mm -hmm. And luckily, the book got a first star, a star re a review. And that's when Britain, I swear to you, Britain <laughs> picked up on it and they were like, oh, 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 can we look at it? You know, yeah. just uh, the Americans saying this is a star review book for um, um, British publishers who had rejected it. The following day, I swear to you, their emails hit my inbox yeah. and they all needed it. <laughs> what? Well, the, I hadn't changed. Yeah. The book hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Now they wanted it. So it's not about me. Yeah. Not about the book. It was about the starred review yeah. from America. Yeah. Wow. That tells you everything. Yeah, it really does. Uh, and in a way, it revived, uh, for me at least, it revived some of the older uh, stuff. Like, you know, Moses Isegawa had written like an epic novel of Uganda yes. as well. Yes. So, you know, in a way, uh, he, you know, he didn't have that same type of timing, even though his book sold a lot. But then it, it brings back the older stuff. So it does a lot. Even a success like that does a lot for unearthing, excavating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because now people ask about other Ugandan books. Yeah, exactly. It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, I want to get to the, like the final lap in a sense of our podcast where I wanted to talk about uh, feminism. I think your works are openly feminist, particularly yeah. Girl is a Bottle <laughs> like of Water. <laughs> they're, not, they're, they're not hiding. <laughs> they're not in the closet. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you know, and also I think Chintu as well, the character of Subi, you know, I've presented papers on the character of Subi as being sort of like a, a central uh, figure in Chintu. Um, but in Girl is a Body of Water is an explicitly you're thinking through the idea of feminism. Uh, yes. It's importance, but also its limits, how it applies within the Ugandan context, how it changes and mutates. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, just a general question. What is feminism to you? Is there a particular Ugandan or an African feminism that you particularly find appealing or that works for you as, you know, a life anthem? Um, for me, feminism is about leveling the field. Mm -hmm. And it's about being, in a, being aware that all systems, uh, be it cultural, socio, political, economic, are rigged against women. Mm -hmm. uh, and in all sorts of ways, both uh, obvious, open, but also um, complicated and complex. And therefore, for me, feminism means being on the lookout for all of these. Uh, and also, for me, feminism is not one one that it has one that fits all. Because, as I said before, women and um, women oppression is normally culturally specific. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's uh, the given that women are oppressed, you know, I, I, across the board. Mm -hmm. But uh, now that that is established, mm -hmm. I would like women to look at uh, their oppression, the way they are oppressed within their cultures and how that is specific and how to find measures to undo their uh, oppressed um, postures. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's always something about each feminism that appeals to me, you know, whether French or American or Black or Africana or womanist. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of African feminism is a little too broad. Yeah. And I, I hope that when we talk about African feminism, it will be a collection of numerous uh, national 
feminisms from all around Africa or from all around the continent. Uh, and that's what works for me. It, it is that unique approach that seeks to address my specific Ugandan experience. But I don't think it is something that is complete at the moment. Mm -hmm. now, I think it is something that we will always be moving towards and working out. And therefore, I think it's a living thing. You know, mm -hmm. we're yeah. not yet there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, what do you think are the challenges for women, uh, for a woman writer today, women writers today? I know that you're a mother and I know that you've also been a professor. Uh, so, you know, there is a lot more juggling that women do that is not always obvious. Yeah, everyone. that is true. And I, I, I can't speak for all women, um, but it, uh, in my view, the major challenges come in the writing and the decision-making processes. You know, should I become an author or not? I love writing. Um, so when I was in Uganda, most of the people I met, the new friends I met were all people who wanted to write as young people, but had weighed it up and decided, you know what, I need to make a living and gave it up. Yeah most of them. So uh, uh, those, uh, for me, the challenges come at that point, mm -hmm. uh, at decision-making, to do it or to go uh, make money, make start a family, do the conformative thing. Mm -hmm. The publishing industry, in my view, is no longer as discriminative as it was for our mothers. In fact, when you look at African publishing, more women are published now than men, or more women are visible than, a man, than men. So I can't really complain about that. <laughs> so, and I believe this, that we are looking at the golden age mm. of women writing in Africa. Uh, there are lots of visible role models, authors for girls to look up to. So there, I am not going to complain, but it's the buildup, uh, the kind of education girls get, the pressure to conform at a certain point, get married, have children, um, earn a living. So the, the, the idea of rebellion to look away from these cultural expectations and focuses. You will hear a lot of public uh, uh, women, women writers saying, I was meant to do A, B, C, D, but I gave it up. So, uh, some men as well, but mm -hmm. men can give it up and carry on, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, uh, uh, the major problem is single motherhood, mm. I think. Um, and I went through that. But for some oh, reason, gosh. someone introduced me to um, Buche Mecheta's books and said mm. the woman had five children. They were <laughs> in London. You know, she was in a culture that didn't support her as a mother. Because mm -hmm. all those structures that support you as a single mother, she had left back in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, this woman kept on writing. You know, and she told me, mm, you can't complain with one child. But I know that there was so much that I had to give up that, that my son suffered as a result of my absence. As uh, uh, often to be an author, you have to be really single-minded and get rid of your guilt. Mm -hmm. for not doing this, for not doing that, which sometimes is interpreted as rebellious or selfishness, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, for me, it's that I, in those processes, you know, uh, for, for single mothers, you're writing the, the absence of support from a spouse, the absence of, or sometimes support from the wider family because they think, you know what, you're writing and you know you're not going to make any, any money out of it. I can tell you that uh, when I left Uganda to come and study creative writing, I told my family that I was coming to study literature. 
Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell them <laughs> that I was coming to spend international fees, which was around 1,500 pounds. And I wasn't sponsored. I was working in nursing homes, looking after people uh, to pay that amount of money. And I was paying to get skills whose um, product I wasn't mm -hmm. sure I, I'm going to make money out of. So I told my family that actually I'm going to study literature. And I remember my mother saying, okay, when you finish, what does that mean? I said, oh, when I finish, uh, now I can become a headmistress of a school. And that made sense. And when I finished the MA and I didn't go back, she asked, what are you doing now? Mm. I said, you know, I am um, doing a PhD. And she asked, what does that mean? I said, that means if I come back, I'll be lecturing at university. She said, okay, that makes sense. And I remember one time my sister wrote to me and said, Jennifer, I mean, this studying you're doing, had you had a child, you know, the child would be in primary school now. Okay. I, absolutely. And because I had had only one child and everybody mm -hmm. was like, what is she doing? So it's until I didn't even tell them when I won the Kwani Prize. I didn't tell them when I published my mm -hmm. agenda. It was only when I won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and uh, we traveled to Uganda and I told my nephew to call, just collect the family and bring them to the party. And then they were like, what? This is what she's been doing? Oh my God, that girl. You know, she, my mother was happy. But she's been lying all along. She's been wow. writing books. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good way to tell them, yeah, yes. I lie. Yeah. So you see the, the challenges. Absolutely. There's so much. The lies <laughs> uh, as well. But um, did you say that Buchi Emicheta was the person you met? who? No, no, no. no. When I or said her work. Her personal. work, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's what I just wondered about. Oh, I wish. Yeah, you know, well, she had the husband who burned her first book. I know. <laughs> what Jeez. a terrible story. Can you imagine somebody burning your manuscript? The level of hate <laughs> in there. So I was going to ask you if you have uh, one tip for women who are starting out as writers. Uh, would you say that one tip is uh, don't have guilt? Mm -hmm. Um, is that just one? I mean, there's the usual read a lot, mm -hmm. but I'll add that reading a lot is not just reading novels, just reading and reading and reading. It's a specific, particular kind of reading. One that you read novels that are doing what you're doing so that you know what not to reproduce you know, to replicate. And you look for the gaps that are missing in what has been written. Mm. That's one. But most important is that reading, your writing is going to depend on what, how your reading skills, how good a reader you were. Because when you write a novel, you have your intentions as a writer, but the book itself, is doing certain things. Now, if you're not a good reader, you're not going to see what the book is doing. Mm -hmm. And this is where you're going to find authors that have uh, threads that are hanging because they didn't see those threads. So the quality of your writing depends on the quality of your reading. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. Names of writers that have inspired you and influenced your work. Um, th this is a hard question for me because it's always asked uh, a few times, um, always asked mm -hmm. whenever I do an interview and I always come up with new names. <laughs> <laughs> Which means, to be fair, that most of the books that I read from the moment I started reading have influenced my writing. I'm just not aware how, where, or what, 
Yeah. Sometimes I stumble on it, but uh, I, I think all of it. In fact, I'm going to do a program on that. Just how how all this reading that I've done have influenced the way that I write. But one of the readers that I have on my table when I'm writing is Toni Morrison. And this is not necessarily to read and understand her books again, because I've done that a thousand times. <laughs> but this is to remind me not to take language for granted. That uh, because when I was young, it's only the poets that paid a lot of attention to language. But now, even in prose, um, you just can't throw lifeless sentences on the page. And Toni Morrison, every time I read her, she reminds me, I'll never write like her. She doesn't influence my writing in a way that I will write similar to her. But she reminds me, Jennifer, you're losing it. You're, you're, you're not paying attention. Because I read uh, uh, like two chapters of hers, come back to my writing and I read it. I'm like, oh my God, what was I, what was I thinking? It's that sort of thing. So she does uh, influence me, but I must say Bessie Head as well. Mm. Uh, I will re reiterate Yvonne Vera and Titi Ndangarembaga. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Great list. And I think this is good. Thank you. I can keep asking you more questions, but we should, we should uh, yeah. I stop. Um, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, I look forward to many more questions and many more sessions and interviews with you. And I will also list, keep out, keep a lookout for the one on all your reading, the, the piece on all the reading. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, yes thank you.